All right, hey, we're in, we're in the book of James, and so we're just plodding through. Uh, the good news about plodding through a book like that is you could miss a Sunday or two, and you still know where we are if you're just kind of tracking with us. And, uh, and so we're just slow rolling our way through the book of James. James is a great book. I'm just going to remind you real quickly and get to the review, and then we've got a short little deal today. But um, James was a half-brother of the Lord, um, and so he, came to, he believed in that he was the Messiah after the resurrection, and uh, but he was fast tracked because he had already lived with Jesus longer than any of the others who were walking with him because he was he was his little brother, and so he had seen Jesus whether he had believed it or not. And you, you know you can't erase what you see and what you know. And then and then when all that comes together and he had it it it, it makes him kind of a solid guy. And so James is one of those who teaches more like Jesus than any of the others. And uh, he's uh, he's a little bit uh, brash, right? He, he doesn't finesse truth. He's just in your face with it. And I love that about him. And so this is, what we're, this is what we're going through. James is determined because what happened in that church, he pastored the first church in Jerusalem. Right after the 120 uh, were filled with the Spirit and, um, and, and there was that great miraculous aspect of what took place there and the, the, the speaking in tongues and everybody was hearing the gospel in their own language and then Peter stands up and he preaches 3,000 get saved, 5,000 get added, and the church is growing. With that growth came great persecution because it was intimidating to those who had denied Christ as Messiah. And so persecution happened. And so they're all scattered and they're all fleeing. And everybody's trying to, to figure out this thing called life. They didn't, they didn't know what life was going to be like without Jesus. They just assumed that it was going to be Him and the kingdom would come and that would be it. And now they've got this pause, so to speak, where they're like, well, wait a minute, He went to heaven. He, he, he said He was coming back. And he did, in the sense of being poured, the Spirit poured out on him. Now, he will return, but there was the Spirit that was poured out. So, you've got these believers scattered everywhere. James is determined that the things that you know in your heart start showing up on the outside of your life. This, this is what James is wanting to do. So, if we could think of hypocrisy uh, is that place where we, what we know isn't being matched by what we do, that, that makes us a hypocrite. That makes us uh, two-faced. Because we know but we don't do. And James is like, hey, can we just crush the middle there and let's just kind of drive those two things together until hypocrisy is gone and you are on the outside what you know on the inside. So this is, this is a really good book for those of us who want to be more like Jesus. There's probably not a better book in the Scriptures to help us understand that. And so we're just slow rolling our way through that. Let's just think about this, right? Um, so if you believe the good news, those around you ought to know that. Not necessarily because of what you say, but because of how you live your life. That's why we title this Living Out Loud, right? That people should know I'm a believer without me necessarily opening my mouth. They should see it in, in the countenance on my face, the, the lack of, of worry and stress, right? The lack of being self-absorbed. All of those things, it, we're wearing it on the outside. So there's a lot of work that happens in our life that, that we don't have ownership of. We have to put off the old man and put on the new. And this is what James is talking about. And so if you believe the good news and those around you ought to see it. And, and so here's where we go. How do you, how do you know that you're saved? Right? How, that's a question that the whole world wants to ask. How do you know that you're saved? You're going to know it because there's going to be something that's going to happen to you on the inside, right? We put a lot of stock in activity, like I walked an aisle, or I filled out a card, or I got baptized, or I prayed a prayer, or I, I and, and, and those are all ways in which God may work in your life, but the truth of how you know that you're a believer is because there's something that's going on on the inside. Now, it may take a little longer for some of us than it does others for it to show, but you should see that. And so this is, this is James, while John, the apostle who Jesus, uh, the scriptures, well, John says, hey, I'm the, I'm the apostle that Jesus loved. <laughs> a little bit of arrogance there in John. But the fact that he, that he said that, and he said, I, he wrote a book too, the first, the, book, the first letter he wrote. He says, I write this that you may know that you have eternal life. And so if you read the book of 1 John and just casually read it, you're going to realize there's certain markers that let you know, ah, I'm a believer. Because a lot of people don't know that they're saved because they think, well, what if I didn't mean what I said? Or what if I did this? Right? And that's where we, that, that battle in us, and Satan loves to hijack that and just, you know, kind of hitch his wagon to that and go, yeah, you, you're nothing, man. You're scum. You should just give up. God ain't got no place for you, right? 
but 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 we we know that if we start seeing these things in us, uh, that that God's doing something because He does that with all of His. Everyone who believes in Jesus, everyone who has His hope, right, purifies himself just as He is pure. There's a putting off that we do. It may be slow, but it's there, right? No one born of God practices sin. They cannot because and God sees it, right? And so there's this. We, we're, we're gonna. We're not gonna practice the old ways because there's something going on in us. I say all that. It's not in the text here, but I say all that just so we'll be clear on that. So how do how do we know? Well, what we know in our heart has to be lived out. In what we do, and the first thing he talked about, we looked at two weeks ago, was ten, it was uh, trials, right? How do we respond when trials come? That's the first test. Now it takes a minute. But at some point, we have to realize that we can't keep playing the victim. I can't just, look, when a trial comes, the world is going to do one of two things. They're going to start blaming everybody else, and they're going to get angry, and they're going to get mad at everybody, because when the trial comes, emotion kicks in. That's the first thing that happens, and so we get angry, right? We get angry at God. Why why God let this happen? Where is God? Because God were here. This wouldn't have happened, right? We start going through all those scenarios. And so what we have to realize is that 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 we know things. There's a purpose behind the trials. Right? The world doesn't see it that way. And so uh, the world will end up with doing pity parties and cry and vent and blame and, and do all of that, right? That, that's not how we respond. The trial comes my way. Listen, you've had some trials before, I think. Anybody here not had a trial is probably the best way to say it, right? Uh, everybody's had a trial, right? And you're either in a trial right now, just coming out of one, are getting ready to head into one. They're just like storms. It's coming, right? And so they come. Now, what are we going to do when that happens? So you guys are in a, in a trial right now, right? I mean, there's a lot of us that are going through that. How will we respond? Here's the thing that makes us different. When I say no, you, Jeremiah lets me know that, that God put his word in my heart. If someone took the Bible from us today and we were never able to see it again, we would still know God because of what He put in our heart through the Word. It, it, it is in there, right? I'm not diminishing the Word that's written that we have, but it's not essential to you and me living this godly life. It is Christ in me, the hope of glory. It is Christ in me, the Spirit of Christ, that speaks to me and say, that, that's not a good way to think, hard dude. How about this, Right? It, it, this is how he works. I, do, I want I want this to be fair and understanding. So, so we know things. We know, right? This is the greatest verse in this. And we usually we only read one section of this verse, Romans eight twenty eight. Right? There's no period there between twenty eight and twenty nine. Ultimately, really, it says this though. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those that love God and are called according to His purpose. Now, when we read that. What comes to mind? Working for your good. We normally think, right, like, um, like, like good stuff, like, like comfort. Like, oh, it's gonna be, well, it's gonna be better, right? Well, it may not be better, in from a realistic outward perspective, because what God says. Listen to verse the twenty nine. For those whom he, he knew, he predestined to become conformed to His image, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers. Oh man, I didn't get the whole deal. Uh, that we would be conformed to His image, to become conformed to His image. Here, here's, here's what happens when a trial comes. It's not so much that on the, on the other side, comfort's going to be there. On the other side, conformity's going to be there. I'm going to look a little more like Jesus, right? I, I know, so I know things. I know that God will take this deficit and turn it into an asset for me, right? This is what's going to happen. And I don't want to keep harping on the leg. I'm almost done with this thing, you know? Um, yesterday I logged 12,000 steps for this old boy to do that all at one time is a big deal. I've got plans. So I'm not, but, but when I was going through that at the beginning and, and I can't move from here to there and I, I feel like I'm a slave to Tammy and she has to do everything or I'm just going to, I'll starve to death and I won't, I won't smell, I, you know, I, I can't get a bat, all those things. Right. But, but here's what I know that I knew when I, when it, when it broke. That's a deficit. God's going to turn an asset. I'm not lying when I tell you that's the first thought I had in my mind. Um, that it's a deficit will turn into an asset. There's so much growth that's happened in my life because of this lady. In, in so many ways. And and I'm I would 
I'm grateful for it. This is this is what I want us to understand. This is not, the world doesn't take it like that. You, what trial are you going through? And I'm going to ask you that question. How are you handling it? Do you know what you know, right? Second thing is, this. so he says, hey, listen, if you don't know, ask for wisdom. And God's going to give it to you and you won't even be mean to you about it, right? He does it without reproach. He's going to, no, nah, I'm, uh-uh. I'm so mad at you right now. You just go sit in the corner and I'll talk to you when I feel like it. That's not him. Parents do that. God doesn't do that. You ask God for wisdom, he's going to go, hey, come here, crawl in my lap, let me talk to you about it, right? That's him. And so he gives me wisdom, but when he, when he gives it, you can't go, well, is there a plan B around here somewhere? Because I don't really like that one, right? If he says, this is what you do, you just do it, right? And so you just trust him. That's what he said. You, oh, I don't feel like forgiving them right now. You don't, they're the ones who put me in it. Just tell them. I want you to forgive them. Now, you can't be double-minded. Yeah, I'm going to get a second opinion on that one. He says, it do not work that way, right? And so, here's what happens, though. And this is what we looked at last week. So that was all kind of review. Now, one more review, and then we're going to jump into the truth now. The second thing he said was, now, when you get tempted, you start blaming God. Because isn't that what happens? We, we have this trial, and we can think about different ways to get through it, Right? I, and those are temptations. Satan loves to go, hey, I got a shortcut for you, bro. Come on. Go this way, right? And and so you could you could do those shortcuts. And every morning we've been watching the weather, uh, you know, just trying to understand it for work and everything else. I'm so amazed that how many lawyers' commercials are on there. And the more I listen to them, the angrier I get. It's like, oh, did you fall? You know, well, here, sue somebody, Right? And, and, and I'm not saying there might not be legitimate cases, but it just feels like ambulance chasers here trying to scam money out of somebody. And that's a temptation, isn't it? I should, I'm going to sue the company for what they did to my leg. It was No, it was my fault. I stepped on a, on a pallet and that stone slid off. I'd like to blame it on somebody. I wanted to blame it on somebody. It was just me. But the temptation is, well, what if I'm not normal again? Maybe I should sue the company. So I can have enough money, and then I can I won't have to work. I'm just telling you, the world does that. That ain't how we do that, right? Temptation comes. It's, it's an emotion, and Satan starts going, "Hey, do this, do that. Lie your way out of that, right? Oh, you're you know why you're in that trial? Yeah, because you got caught. And so deny, 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 la la la, and then you won't have to pay the piper." Right? This is this is this is what happens. And J- James is going, uh-uh, we're not doing that. When we see a trial, we know things and we cry out for wisdom. We don't play the victim. We're not pity party guys. We're, we're gonna do this thing. And I'm not gonna choose door number one that Satan's over there dangling the shiny thing there, right? That's what he talks about in temptation. Listen, you're it happens because two things come together. You want it, and, and that there was a lure there, there was an opportunity, a bait. That's what that that's what that's what temptation means. It's a lure. Just like a lure when you're fishing. That's all Satan does. Hey, look at this shiny thing. That may feed you, right? And the fish is stupid, aren't they? Don't don't be a stupid fish. That's the whole point of temp, of temptation. Don't be the fish. Don't take the bait of Satan. It's stupid. Because it will never advance you to the place you want to be. Now, those are all bottom line. I mean, that's all just stuff for you to listen to and everything else. Now he comes in and he says this. So this is today. Let's go back to it. Verse 19, you know this, beloved brother. I love how he says this. Look, you already know this in your heart. So how about you start living it out this way, right? That's why we get living out loud. You know this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Not everyone, now everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For a man's anger does not bring about the righteousness of God. Now, this is not about our conversation, right? I mean, there, there's great truth in that. Don't... don't be quick to listen, right? Slow to speak. I, my, my my go-to is always speak first, listen later. I, I, I've always I, I'm trying hard to, to not do that. But when I was younger, in my younger days, and I'm I, I'm not proud to say it, but I used to say, man, if you give me five minutes with you, I can give you three things that will change your life. And you know, because I'm that's how smart I am, right? I I, I can see it. I can I can fit. That's just stupid. Uh, and, and, you know, I was always taught he gave us two ears and one mouth so that we would listen more, you know, those kind of little silly things you said. But the reality is, 
Uh, there's a lot about speaking quickly that, that gets us in trouble. I'm a bottom line guy. And, you know, so sometimes when people are talking, I'm like, man, that's way too many words. Do we, I, sometimes in my head I'm doing this. Is there, is there, is there a bottom line somewhere? Can, can, we, can, we, can, we land, can, can we land this plane? One for two things. One, either I want to talk or I'm tired of hearing you talk, right? And, and so, so what I'm saying is there, there's, we, we all have this tension. I would say that Proverbs 17, 28, it's not a bad proverb to remember. Even a fool appears wise if he shuts up. I mean, you just want to improve your game? Shut up. I mean, that's kind of what he's saying. You don't want to be seen as a fool? Shut up. Now, he's not talking about that in this lesson here. He's talking about the word and how we respond to it, and the context is going to do that. So it's not really about the tongue. It's about hearing the word. So let's just read it again together, and we're just going to walk through it. He says, and, and think of it in terms of listening to God speak, right? Because he just spoke about wisdom. And so the context is still in that kind of flow. And so he says this, You know this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Now everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For man's anger does not bring about the righteousness of God. Therefore, ridding yourselves of all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your soul. So what's he saying here? Hey, listen, be quick to hear the word. That's it. Transformation happens... When we hear the Word of God. That's, that's why one of the favorite things that we do here is we just walk through Scripture. Listen, TED Talks aren't going to fix you. They'll motivate you. But they're not going to fix you. Too much TED Talking is happening in churches these days. And, and, and there's, there's too much TikToking going on too, man. There, there's, you, you get on TikTok and you hear a bunch of fools babbling what they babble. It's crazy. I'm just telling you. It, that... TikTok is going to be the end of a lot of people's spiritual lives if they're not careful. And TED Talk in churches are going to be the demise of a lot of people. What we need to hear when trouble comes, whether you want it or not, is the Word of God. Be quick to listen to that. Right? Find you somebody that knows Jesus and knows the Word. That's what you want. Not the arrogant one. I don't want the arrogant guy who knows the Word. I want the humble guy that knows the Word. And when they speak it, it just comes out. Find you some old person. I'm, I'm, I'm Medicare qualified now, so I'm not sure if that makes me old or not, but I got my card now, May, May 1st, baby. I'm a Medicare guy. That's my Medicare birthday happened, right? But but find you somebody older and listen to them, right? I mean, listen, I was blessed to have a dad and a father-in-law that were good men. I've been blessed to have some elders in my life that were, that were 10, 15 years older than me. Godly men taught me a ton about life. Find you somebody. Listen to it. Just read the Word. Listen to it. This is, this is crucial for us to live on the outside, what we are on the inside. I have to have the Word. It is the Word that transforms me. That's it. That's what happens. Choose conformity over comfort. Right? Listen, there's no easy way to get the Word into you. I try to make it fun and palatable as we do it, but sometimes it's just digging in there and getting it out, right? It's just reading the Word. Just reading it. Thinking about what it says. Reminding yourselves when you walk by the way. Too many people do this. Do this. Let me get the book. book. Let me put my timer on. I read for five minutes. Good. Check. I'm good. I'm ready to go. Right? That, that's not going to get you anywhere. It feels good. It's an activity. Check, check, check. It's not going to change your life. I mean, it has the potential to because you did read it. I'm not, I'm not diminishing that. I'm saying it's not about reading, it's about meditating, it's about letting that thing get all up in your business, right? If the Word's not getting all up in your business, you ain't doing it right. If you don't get mad at the Word sometime and go, I don't like what that just said, you're not reading it right, right? When it says, forgive your brother from your heart, or I won't forgive you, I don't like that, right? I'm like, wow, what do you, what's he saying here? He's saying, you don't have an option. I got a buddy at work, not any... He smiles every time I come in because he was telling me he ain't he don't ready he's not ready to forgive his mom. I'm like, well, you know, there's not a point where you get ready. You just need. To. And so I walked in the other day and I go, hey man, how'd your mom react when you forgave her? Uh, well, I, I I know I need to. I, no, it, you we had this conversation already. Now let's let I want to hear what happens when and you don't have to call her if that's what you're worried about. Just forgive her right here. It'll be all right. And so this is what I'm talking about. This is, this is how the Word works. This is, this is, be quick to hear that. Listen to it. 
one who knows the word has a distinct advantage over the world that doesn't know. And the world gets rattled. But if you don't, man, I'm watching our whole world fall apart because they lack truth. They lack discernment and they lack truth. And they have believed a lie, and someone has spun that lie so much that they're convinced that it's truth. And they're living in this upside down world and they don't even know. It's a, it's a prison, man. You start talking to people out there who don't know Jesus, their mind is messed up. And too many Christians' minds are messed up because they've been sitting under people who don't know what they're doing and they've been telling you a bunch of hooey and this is the result. Now, I don't want to sound like I'm on a rant. I'm just telling you that's what's going on. And so what we need is the truth. Truth gives me wisdom and it gives me direction. Then he says this, be slow to speak. All right, so there's a quick to hear, slow to speak. Now, I think this is why I suit. I think this is about how, aren't there sometimes you want to give somebody a piece of your mind? Like, like, like me, you know, when I say, hey, man, give me five minutes, I'll tell you exactly how to change your life. Man, that's a stupid, arrogant statement to make. But how many times do we want to give people advice without really listening to what's going on in their life? Okay. And I've, I've had so many people want to speak into my life about things. Like, and I'm, I'm going to be polite. I'm going to listen. I'm like, you don't have a clue what I'm going through right now. Okay. There's such a thing called empathy that should take place before you decide to speak. Because until you've walked where they are, at least can, can somehow figure out how to finesse that way you get around to that side of the table and try to feel what they feel. You, best bet is just to shut up. Too many people speak too fast, and this is what he's saying here. Your opinion isn't going to change somebody's life. The truth will. Just slow roll this. This is what he's saying. And so for me, I think it's important... And this is an art I'm learning because I've not always been a listener. I'm a talker. But, but to listen first. And so I've got these guys that are coming to my office now, and I feel like I'm kind of Switzerland to work now. You know, I'm, a, I'm that safe place. If they want to come vent about somebody, they come in there. And all the upper knows that, that I'm, that I'm Switzerland. I'm, I'm not going to tell them everything people tell me. I'm going to filter it. What I think needs to go up line, I'll go up line. And, and so I'm listening. I'm learning to listen to what people say without responding to things. This is what James, I mean, Paul says to the Ephesians, when he says, put off the old man, he said, so then he says that we shouldn't just say whatever we feel, right? But but yet we should filter it through what is best for someone else, right? And to speak a timely word. And so this is, this is powerful of what that means. So I have to listen to understand the situation. Then I filter that situation through Scripture, right? And then I speak uh, the solution that I believe God has. That, that's what This is what he's saying. This is what, hey, look, we're all here to help each other out. We're here to help each other move, move the hypocrisy in our life. So that's how it happens. And then he says this, be slow to anger. At, at what are we being slow to anger at? The Word of God. Have you ever been angry at the Word? We, I mean, we just mentioned earlier, there are times I'll read that, I don't like that very much. Right? Hey, be slow to anger. Don't, don't, don't put God over here as the enemy. Because He loves you. He's redeemed you. He created you. He set your feet on this site at the exact time and places when, you, when He chose to. He has a vested interest in you because you are a part of His creation. And so that process has to be, let's, let's don't get so mad at God about what we read in the Word. Let's let it sift through. And I, I think I've, I've shared this with you way too many times, but Corey Ten Boom and her sister Betsy, when, they, when the fleas were in the Nazi prison camp, and Corey Timboom saying, we should give thanks to God for these fleas. Betsy was so angry at her. I am not. It, 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 no, I'm not doing it. And it wasn't until several months later when she realized that the soldiers weren't coming into that barrack because they didn't want to be, be flea infested. And their barrack was the only one that they, had, they could continue to work because no one was searching to see what contraband they had in there. And so Betsy looked at, at Corey and said, you're right. We have the word that we can read in our barracks that the others don't because of the fleas, right? And so this is how this works. So what does this look like? He says, uh, therefore, ridding yourselves of all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your soul. It's, it's the word of God that's going to transform us and change. Let just, let's just, when, you know, when we open it up, Pause a little bit. Just, just pray like we do here. Hey, Lord, speak to me as I read through this. Read through it. Let it, let it get in you. Be a doer of it. 
right? Let, let, let it show you its flaws, your flaws, and, 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 then, and then the blessings that come from it. Let's, let's just read this, we'll be done. But prove yourselves to be doers of the word, right? That's what he's saying. Hey, let's, let's do what it says. I dare you. Just do what the word says, right? Be generous. I'm telling you, there's something about that where he tells me, let him who steals steal no longer, but let him labor with his hand, performing what is good, that he may have something to give to those who have need. I'm telling you, you start reading Corinthians, it talks about giving, and you'll never not have a, a supply in order to keep giving. It's a powerful truth in the Scriptures. I dare you to take that truth and decide that you're going to pull out some money out of your paycheck every week, and you're going to find somebody who needs it, you're going to listen to the Spirit, and when He says, I want you to give it to them, you do it. You don't judge them. You don't wonder what, 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 what's going on. That you, if the Lord impresses you, you just do it. That's what it means to be a doer of the Word, right? Too many times we say, well, they should, they should go get a job. Well, hey, how about you quit playing God and you just listen to Him for a second, right? This is, this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like to be a Christ follower. We can get all high and mighty about everything, but this is, this is what it says. And then He says this, For if anyone is a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he has. But one who has looked intently at the perfect law, the law of freedom, and has continued in it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an active doer, this person will be blessed in what he does. What's he saying, man? Hey, just look in the mirror. Oh, you know what it's like looking. I hate looking in the mirror. Before I look in the mirror, I feel like I'm a 30-year-old man in the prime of his life in great shape. I look in that mirror and I'm like, who the heck is that guy? <laughs> right? And so it's like, why look in the mirror? And then sometimes some of you should be looking in the mirror because you looked all messed up. You jacked up and you should like, do something, right? And this is what he's saying here. Hey, listen, I'm going to look in this word and I go, well, I don't like it. I ain't going to do that anymore, right? I don't look like that. and That's making me feel bad. No, maybe you should spend a little more time in the mirror looking at it so that it, it will let you clean up and look like you ought to look like. This is the point of the word. This is what he's saying here. This is why James is so practical in everything that he's got going on. And that's the truth. Let's sing our way out of here. I got a great song. I'm grateful for mercy. Here.